welcome to this episode of Captains of Industry. I am Kukule Tukzele. Tonight we have the pleasure of coming to you from the headquarters of the Industrial Development Corporation, celebrating 75 years of industrial development in South Africa's borders and abroad. But given the background of South Africa's economic fundamentals, where we're losing ground when it comes to economic growth and confidence levels in the business sector are at multi-year lows, now more than ever is the time when we need to position South Africa competitively in order to take advantage of the global growth as well as uh, growth enhancers and potentials which will exceed South Africa's performance in the areas of industrial development. Well, tonight we're going to pick the brains of two captains of industry who represent two significant sectors in South Africa's economic context, mining and manufacturing. And they'll be giving us their thoughts and insights as well as possible suggestions as to how to drive industrial development within South Africa. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome to my left Mr. Sipongosi, the outgoing chief executive of Exaro Resources and uh, next to him is Mr. Peter Maclare, the outgoing chief executive of Tiger Brands. And I'd like to get your opening comments and quick overview with regard to the current state of industrialization in your respective sectors. Mr. Ngozi, let's start with you. Thank you very much. Uh, well, my view of industrialization um, is that South Africa has been on this journey for a very long time. And, uh, you know, it's quite interesting that we are in this building uh, which houses the IDC, which was one of the pillars of industrialization of South Africa, if you go back in the 20s, and, and, and the formation of uh, industrialization, probably moving away slightly from the mining sector. So I think it's, it's really great that we celebrate today the IDC's contribution, because the mining sector today and the mining, mining sec sector, I think, into the future is going to be solely dependent on the support of the IDC. And, and, and therefore, it's, it's quite important for us to understand where the country is. Uh, people think that mining is probably a sunset business. It's not a sunset business. I, I, I've been there for many, many years. I can tell you now that, that I'm, we still have long legs, and this industry is going to do pretty well for South Africa. What we need is more focus, what is, we need is more vision, what we need is more direction, and people who are passionate about this, about, about this industry, and it will work. People, focus, direction. Mr. McClary, let's get your opening thoughts on manufacturing, where there's certainly a lot of pressure too in that particular sector when it comes to industrialization. It's across the continent that everyone is looking for an industrialization strategy. So, as much as we talk of industrialization in South Africa, let's remember that there's a lot of capital that is being attracted across our borders for a range of reasons, and we'll come back to sort of the policy context. In South Africa itself, in the manufacturing sector that I'm part of, um, we've got some legacy industries and we've had to start modernizing, and so unless we do so, we won't compete as well as we ought to compete, and that comes with some good and some bad parts. Um, you see lots of consolidation in the industry, and that tends to lead to unemployment, and that mm -hmm. is a major social and economic problem that is certainly increasing rather than decreasing. So in the short to medium term, I'm concerned that uh, given the lack of economic growth, you're going to see increasing consolidation, um, which will be accompanied by mechanization in a manner that perhaps hasn't been seen hitherto. And then, I suppose, thirdly, given the global networks that enable you to transport product from one part of the globe to, the, to, to South Africa in a relatively short space of time now and competitively, uh, you're going to see different types of competitors entering our market. We're already beginning to see that. And so it, we, I think we're in for a very difficult time. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about that because potentially we are experiencing that difficult time right now, as you've both alluded to, the tough economic climate where South Africa recorded negative growth in the second quarter of this year. And even if you look at the third quarter PMI data, on average it was at 48.7, and business confidence levels as well at multi-year lows. Mm -hmm. How do we drive that level of industrialization when for investors like the IDC potentially and other uh, capital uh, uh, investors tend to sit on the cash because they're wary of investing when there's no guarantee of a return on investment? I'm not so sure we 
simplistically just sit on the cash. Unfortunately, or fortunately, we all have to give a return to our shareholders. And so whatever we begin to invest in, if we can't demonstrate a reasonable return, no, shareholders vote with their cash, right? So they're going to go elsewhere. So um, I certainly look at some of my competitors and ourselves. We've been investing anything between 800 and a billion rand a year in capital, in capex, in order to improve our competitiveness. So we're not sitting on cash per se. It's almost an oversimplification of what happens. Clearly, confidence is at a low, and therefore, if we are going to expand, we need to have, I would say, uh, the confidence that we would continue to have sustainable economic environments to give that return. And that's hard in this environment. It's not peculiar to South Africa. As you know, it happen it's, it's, it's really representative of what's happening in the rest of the world. There's huge investments that, that go into into starting an operation, for instance. I mean, we, in the last uh, nine, 10 years, for instance, we, we spent over 9.8 billion just to expand one mine uh, at Khrodekhalak in, 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 uh, in, in Lepalan. We're spending 3.8 billion just to start a new mine in, in Bumalang. We're spending 16 billion in terms of uh, staying in business because you have to invest in your equipment for you so that you continue the business. So we're not, uh, the industry is not sitting on, on money, but the money that we have is limited and, and needs to be deployed prudently to areas where it should go. But at the same time, as, as Peter says, it's critical to think of shareholders who are owners of capital because they give you money to invest because they're expecting a return. And we ought to consider that one as well. And that's why now and again, when things are okay, we pay dividends and all those things so that they, they benefit. Uh, you know, I think that's very, very important. If it's not an issue of capital, then is it an issue of policy direction? I am cognizant of the fact that uh, we have the Minister of Economic Development with us in the room. We've been trying to avoid him, you know. <laughs> and I'm sitting Please next don't. to him, right? So. This is the ideal time maybe to address <clears throat> certain elements and, and factors of legislation and regulation which could aid uh, further industrialization. But when you look at the current landscape, is it supportive of this ideal? Yeah, I mean, look You at, can be honest, Mr. Nkosi. Look at South Africa, I'm always honest. <laughs> South Africa. You know, look, look at it in, in phases. Prior to 1994, it was a different South Africa. Mm. South Africa had to change. South Africa had to have a new mining law and new other initiatives that were put in place. So to understand and to interpret that law takes a bit longer. It doesn't take one day to interpret that one. In, in some instances, we have to go to courts and do that one. We've taken government to court, by the way, on several occasions to get clarity on a number of things. So this thing of once empowered, always empowered is not new. We always play this game with government. We take them to court all the time. <laughs> the law can be interpreted by anyone in a particular manner. So legislation is a key issue. So if you're sitting outside the industry and looking at what we are doing, debating and and slow pace of change in that industry, you think that things are uncertain in the area. It may be uncertain because it brings in uncertainty, but we must understand that this is a journey. Over a period of time, legislation is key. But when legislation changes every time the minister comes in, it becomes a problem. A problem. Uh, and it, it's, it's quite prevalent in, in South Africa that a new minister comes in, new laws come in and, and, and you wonder sometimes because it's one political party that's in charge why these changes are taking place. And that brings in quite a lot of uncertainty to the investors. So investors will say, you know what? In South Africa, I'm not even sure what they want. I'm happy in Zimbabwe because I know what Bob wants. <laughs> you know, it's, very, it's very clear what he wants and he gives it to you. You go there, you know that I have to do 49%, he's taking 51%, and I have to pay for that 51% of these. But if I run my model such that I can still make money, I will do that. Mm. But there's certainty insofar as that one is concerned. <clears throat> 
you mentioned the element of certainty, and perhaps this also brings us to the new visions or new goals that we're also trying to work towards. It's the National Development Plan. It's the IPAP as well that we have in place, as well as the new growth path. Does this help? You mentioned people power and, and direction, if I'm not mistaken, in your opening remarks. Does this help in guiding us to understand what it is that we're working towards, uh, but perhaps breaking it down further to uh, really uh, have, have tangible results is the difficult part here. That's Peter's answer. I'm going to have more support. <laughs> Mr. McClary, go ahead. Look, um, you can go all the way back to 94. I think all of these frameworks have continued to evolve, and they've had to evolve so three reasons. The first is that um, we've not got the challenge of sorting out poverty right yet. Mm -hmm. And therefore, how do you have inclusion and growth at the same time? And sometimes that can be seen to be contradictory and certainly it's harder to do rather than easier to do. So you do need policy that enables social development. It's critical for us. At the same time, you need policy that recognizes that some of that transformation comes at a cost and therefore is there a way to create an environment that is conducive to more investment. So that's at one level. At another level, that micro stuff I call it. I mean, I used to work for Rural Cause sitting over there and he'll tell you that for the last 30 years we've been talking about making it easier for small business to succeed. I used to run around and he would send me here, there and clip me around the ear when I didn't get it right. Hmm. But for the last 30 years we've been talking about how do we make it easy for small business to succeed. Um, we still seem to be faced with the same challenges and so is it that our economic or other models simply don't work? Uh, what is it about us that's peculiar? Why don't we have those black industrialists that have evolved as quickly as we would have thought they would have? Okay, is it a policy issue or is it something called being an entrepreneur and wanting to take risk and having the capital to take risk? The last one for me in terms of policy, I suppose, policy and policy certainty, is that you have to look at the total value chain, practical example. For me to move goods from one part of the world into South Africa costs me more once it hits South Africa's borders as opposed to out of the US. I move corn out of the US all the way to Durban, it'll cost me X. By the time I've moved it from Durban all the way to Johannesburg, it's X times three or X times four, Y. We've got a road, a road network that actually is very challenged. We have a rail network that no longer caters for industries such as mine. So anything in agro-processing, Sipo gets first preference. If he's got coal mm. or steel, How do you know he that? gets first preference. <laughs> but, but for <coughs> consumer goods, we don't have that preference at all. And therefore, if you look, look at the rate of growth in logistics companies, road-based logistics companies, they've rocketed over the last 20 odd years. Why? Because we don't have access to what ought to be relatively cost-effective rail. That's a big issue for us in the manufacturing industry. Mm -hmm. I'd like to explore the thought process then regarding innovation because that's certainly where uh, perhaps other methods of logistics uh, can be employed within the South African landscape of things. And just to bring up an example, in the energy environment, we know the pressure that our national grid has been under and alternatives to coal, Mr. Ngozi, have also been employed where the likes of uh, biogas is now being used to supply energy to uh, BMW's Roslyn plant in Pretoria, up to 30% of its energy supply. Is this where we also need innovative thinkers who are game changers and who have that capital as well as backing from uh, established players in the industry in order to grow and again reindustrialize the economy. Innovation is what is going to help us to be more competitive around the world because we have to compete with all other players around the world. If we don't do that, it ain't going to work. What makes innovation possible is if we focus on young people we need to focus on young people, take them to school, train them appropriately so that they play a key role in this innovation game. Some two years ago, three years ago, I, we got a group of, uh, 
of young people, these graduates, and we wanted for them to design for us a mine of the future uh, in, in, in uh, and the structure, the organization of the future by 2050. You'd be amazed what they come up with. It's like Disneyland, and you, under, you don't understand how mining could look like Disneyland, but that, that's what it is. And that takes you to another level. Mm -hmm. And South Africa needs to focus on developing the skills such that we are able to do this. Not to do the same old, same old, same old, but look at what others are doing and let us move forward on that area. We see what's happening in the newspaper headlines at the moment with the unrest taking place and protest action at South Africa's universities with regard to school fees. But re regardless of that, the, the, the level of investment in individuals, and perhaps you're also best positioned to respond to this, given the fact that you helped enable Exaro Resources to become one of the most empowered mining companies in South Africa through ASC's we call as well. How do we do that where there is refocused investment individuals, not just giving them equity and ownership, but allowing them and empowering them to be decision makers, to sit at the table and sit on stage like this today and be the captains of industry. Further investment individu in individuals which would realign again with the BE policies we have in South Africa. I truly believe that young people are probably better placed to do amazing things than myself. My job is to give counsel here and there. But the, the key thing is that you find a lot of energy, you find a lot of drive from them. I think it's critical that we look at them and we invest in them. The second thing that I want to say is that business, particularly black business, need to start talking amongst themselves in terms of what they wish to do. Mm. Because there's a, we don't talk that much amongst ourselves and therefore we don't tend to support one another in this game of building businesses and building in, 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 in industries that we need. In if I may interject there for a moment, Why? is there because there is a perception, <laughs> is it because there's a perception that if you share the pie amongst too many that uh, uh, your slice or your dividends as we referred to earlier might be a lot smaller? No, no, not necessarily. I think it's going to get there. We evolve. And that's why we have partners like the IDC who support us. And because we converge around here, we get a lot of time to talk. It's just that there's lots of expectation on us to work, so we tend to focus too much on our businesses uh, rather than talking. So, but I think that is critical. You know, th there's no country that is going to go forward unless people pull their resources together and start to have a conversation there's no conversation. If, if government is going to drive a conversation on their own and business are going to drive the conversation on their own, we are not likely to make it as a country. Mr. McClary, let's get your views. You've worked both in the private sector and public sector. You've received the counsel of some of our learned leaders here. Uh, your thoughts on tapping into the... He's retiring. How can we... <laughs> I'm a youth. Sometimes I think we try to be just a little too simplistic about the youth, the youth, the youth. I mean, these... Mm. So it, it, as usual, it's an old chestnut. It starts with, have we trained people to give them the basics that allow them to build a platform from which to become innovative? And I don't mean innovative as in you can sell three maguinha there and five there. Let's move them out of those traditional industries that have been known as small businesses or small industries, by way of example. I was speaking to Jeffrey and saying, well, if I look at our factories, uh, effluent is a big issue for us. How do we train youngsters to begin to look differently at playing a role in effluent management, water system management, rather than simply carrying boxes, etc.? So now, if you go to training t technical colleges, etc., we ought to be partnering those technical colleges in beginning to create those opportunities for those that are much younger than uh, uh, my, my, my senior to my right. But and, and I'm being quite serious about yeah. that. Their business models have to, and are very different from the, or mental models, than from our mental, than our mental models. So how do you take people into new and different industries, as opposed to the traditional ones that say, well, you're in manufacturing, you'll pack a can in this way or in that way. So that's the one. The second has <laughs> got to be in biotechnology and science. For me, if I look at legislation, Minister, um, 
that keeps coming down the track, taking salt out of food, mm -hmm. reducing sugar, etc. How do we begin to develop enzymes and, and mm -hmm. technologies that begin to intervene at that level again? So if you begin to look elsewhere, Asia, etc., the youth are driven in those technical directions mm -hmm. as opposed to some of the traditional ones that we've tended to want to want to drive them in. And the last, of course, is always, I, I, I always say that some people don't want to be part of large corporations. They want to run their own small enterprises. Something else that's been highlighted in our conversation today by Mr. Krina of the IDC is the mobilization to grant access to markets, more importantly, across the African continent, which both of you have had the opportunity to explore on, whether it's an iron ore in the DRC or when it comes to Dangote, as well as uh, uh, other initiatives within the Kenyan market. And I'd like to start off with you, Peter, because you've been very vocal about the pitfalls and perhaps mistakes that have been made when it comes to our ventures into the rest of the continent. Are there lessons that we can learn that are happening in these other markets that we can employ here in South Africa uh, when it comes to boosting industrialization of South Africa's economy? These markets have existed for many, 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 many years. And so for us to go in as the new colonialists, we will fall on our faces. I'm not suggesting everybody does that, but it really becomes an issue, whether you're in East Africa, West Africa, Central Africa, there's a national pride. They are not looking for people to come and mm. tell them what to do. Mm. So that's the first part. Partnership is a really difficult thing. It's like a marriage, if I could use that as an analogy. You really continue to have this toing and froing, ebbing and flowing. It's great when you own the asset yourself, right? Because you can make any decision at any point in time. It's your capital, it's your risk. But if you really want to remain in those countries for the long term, you do need partnership. And that always requires some form of I almost want to call it humility, a willingness to learn. I'm not saying being humble means being weak, but being prepared to learn. So if you buy where example, let's look at West Africa, and you look at the logistic challenges of moving goods to market in West Africa. I can tell you, our, our part of the world is much easier. It's, it's so easy, in fact, mm. that they think we have it very, very nice. So how do we change our economic, commercial, or business models in order to adapt to those environments. Having said that, I come back home as a last comment and say, I look at how many of the traders that have come out of East and Central Africa have come into our markets uh, as small shop owners, retailers, etc. and what have they done? They've used very different models. They open two, three hours earlier than yeah. our normal uh, stores would open, and they close two, three hours later. They st I'm not suggesting they should sleep in stalls, but you'll find somebody does <coughs> sleep in the store. He will charge you for a loaf of bread 15, 20% more between 6 and 7 in the morning when everybody else opens. He will then change his price during the course of the day, and by the evening at 9 o'clock, you go and buy another loaf of bread, the price would have gone up again. So there, there are a range of practices that demonstrate a different way of doing business that I think we still have to be infused with. Lessons that we can learn. Mr. Nkosi, your thoughts? I, I, mean, I, I couldn't agree more with what he's just said in terms of how we behave when we are in very many countries, not only on the continent, but I think that is important to acknowledge that national pride. It's very, very critical that we look at that. But of course, you know, the business that we're involved in, which is really bulk business, and it, it suffers if you do not have uh, the necessary infrastructure to handle that one. Mm -hmm. And that's why you battle. And of course, one of the things that we probably take for granted in South Africa, we complain about the law. We have the law in South Africa. We have those, those conventions that assist us. In some instances, in other countries, for you to start a mine, it has to go all the way to parliament and get parliament to approve it before anything happens. So all those things delay the process. So I think we, we're very, very fortunate. We need just to continue improving what we have here in the country. Anybody who goes into these markets today, if they expect to get the kind of returns in a three to five year period uh, in what I would call really emerging early adopter markets. You're not being realistic. And I sometimes 
come to the conclusion that a number of our investors just don't have that patience on accretion, as we'd like to say. They simply want to continue to see some miracle called China happening overnight, or <coughs> Africa rising, and suddenly, you know, it's payday in six months' time or in a year's time. You really have to have patience. I'm not suggesting you must lose money in perpetuity, but these are long-term developing markets as opposed to short-term cash-rich markets. So don't fall victim to the J-curve syndrome, clearly. Speaking on behalf of the sector that you represent, what are you hoping uh, the future of industrialization in South Africa will look like? I'm hoping that, I mean, if you look at the last 25 years, we haven't developed green fields operations in South Africa to a large degree. We tend to focus on putting empowerment on the old mines that are going to give them problems going forward and they're not going to make money uh, and they're going to deal with uh, problems of, of, of the environmental issues over a period of time. Mm. How I wish that as South Africans we should start deploying resources on growth, new operations, more high-tech ones so that the country would move forward. But to do that you need people who are going to focus people who are passionate about their own business. You've got to take a value chain approach. So it's pointless looking at one part of industry. You've got to look right the way back to, in my world, uh, agro-processing, and therefore, how do you invest in agriculture and other in order to create that opportunity for uh, further industrialization? What I am concerned about is that a number of, com of countries north of our borders and further afield are creating the kind of incentives that could ultimately lead to deindustrialization. So they begin to look at, so Peter, why don't you put the pasta plant in Ethiopia or in Kenya and we'll give you a 25-year tax break because they're trying to compete for that capital. And I think over the next few years, that pressure will increase if we are not careful and therefore we need to have back to policy, kind of mm. exciting policy. Which is a conversation that we're not keen on having We're not tonight. gonna have tonight. No. Exactly. Gentlemen, thank you so much for your participation in the conversation tonight. Uh, no doubt giving us your insights with regard to uh, industrialization in South Africa's economy and our audience as well for participating. That's where we leave it for this edition of Captains of Industry. For CNBC Africa, I'm Kukule Tutele. Until next time, take care. Mm.